Get three months of local news for just 99 cents a month. You'll get unlimited access to the news you need to stay engaged and connected to your community. Visit inforum.com slash subscribe now to get three months of local news for only 99 cents a month. A life at Le Mans that started on the prairie of North Dakota. Hi, this is Tracy Briggs and welcome to Back Then. If you had no other information about this man, other than this one photo, you could probably still make some assumptions about the kind of man he might be. There's an elegant, aristocratic air about him, smiling under his tweed flat cap, as if the photographer caught him mid-conversation with a chum over drinks at the club. He looks like he might be named Nigel, Liam, or Simon. Something about him just screams Great Britain. Rightly so. It turns out that that man, Bob Blake, spent much of his life in England helping vault Jaguar, the iconic luxury British automobile, into the stratosphere. But the fact is, Bob Blake started his life on the humble prairie of North Dakota. Neville Swales of Coventry, England, has never been to North Dakota, but he's become an expert on one of the state's native sons. Swales runs Building the Legend, where he creates meticulously engineered cars inspired by Jaguar's 1966 SJ-13 Le Mans prototype. He says he never had the pleasure of meeting Bob Blake during his association with the company, but Blake left an impression on just about everyone with whom he worked. Swales went into great detail about Bob Blake in a story he wrote for his blog called Bob Blake, an Artist in Metal. After reading the blog post, I knew I wanted to learn more about this man. So Swales agreed to do a Zoom call with me. We started off talking about something very important. How do you pronounce the car? The name of the car. Like most Americans, I always said Jaguar. But Mr. Swales said Jaguar or Jaguar. <laughs> so that is the preferred way the car company likes to be called. So I'm going to do my very best as I read this story for this podcast to say it the British way, Jaguar. So please bear with me. My American voice may come out and say Jaguar, but you'll know what I'm talking about. Anyway, I had a lovely chat with Mr. Swales, and we, we covered a lot about the life and times of the North Dakota kid, Bob Blake, who just may have changed the face of racing forever. So here's his story. Bob Blake was born in Elbow Woods, North Dakota, on the Fort Berthold Indian Reservation, most likely around 1916. I say most likely because some records, including his World War II draft card and some census reports, indicate that he was born in 1914. So we're not, not quite sure of the date, but it, other, other indications um, point to it being 1916. So again, around 1916 um, in North Dakota. Elbow Woods was a small town founded in 1899, but wiped off the map in the 1950s as rising waters from the Garrison Dam put it and a handful of other towns along the Missouri River under what is now Lake Sakakawea. It appears Bob Blake's father, Missouri-born Frank Blake, was a U.S. government photographer on assignment at Fourth Berthold when Bob was born. The family also included Bob's mother, Mildred, who was a native of Eagle Bend, Minnesota, Bob's older sister, and a younger brother. After their time in North Dakota, the Blakes eventually moved to Arlington, Virginia, where Bob attended Washington Lee High School. He was tall, six feet four, with movie star good looks. His yearbook proclaimed him to be, quote, the tallest senior at Washington Lee and a whiz at football and basketball. But Blake didn't just dabble in sports. He was a car guy. He started working on cars and doing body work as a hobby. Swale says he taught himself to weld at the age of 19, and a lifelong interest in racing cars and their construction began. But like it was for many men of his generation, his hobby would have to wait. World War II had started, and Blake was sent to the United Kingdom with the U.S. Third Army. While there, he met his future wife, Jean, and he got a peek at the life he was meant to live. But not quite yet. 
After the war, he came back home to the U.S. to set up a workshop building sprint and race cars. His reputation was growing around the country. He worked on cars for Indianapolis and with Alec Ullman, a promoter of sports car racing in the U.S. His relationship with Ullman would lead him to his next big break. Ullman told Blake that Briggs Cunningham, another American car enthusiast, had entered two Cadillacs at Le Mans. After tweaking the cars for the race, the appearance of the cars was still a little less than ideal. You'll have to see a picture of it in my story on Inform.com to see what I'm talking about. It was kind of a clunky, you know, for a race car, it looked a little clunky. So, in fact, the French, the French press called one of the cars Le Monster, which you can probably translate for yourself, means the monster. Blake flew to Le Mans and worked nonstop for 48 hours, no sleep, to get the cars into racing form. Now, they didn't win that year, but they did have respectable showings, enough that Cunningham hired Blake for his new company. Then, Blake built every car Cunningham sent to Le Mans for the next several years. The cars finished as high as third place. Cunningham chose to close his company in 1955, but gave Blake a glowing recommendation for what was to come next. The origins of the now iconic British car giant Jaguar go back to 1922. In the years that followed, Jaguar made a name for itself by producing a series of successful eye-catching sports cars. In November of 1955, the former North Dakota boy, Bob Blake, joined the team thanks in part to Cunningham's recommendation. Swale says one of Blake's first responsibilities was to convert the stock of the obsolete D-type racers into road cars, the XKSS cars. That meant adding parts like bumpers. Blake once wrote, I made all the frames and bits and pieces, including all the wooden tools, to make everything from. I made the first set of bumpers by cutting down the old big bumper, using the top radius and the bottom radius, cutting the flute out and welding the two pieces together. Blake then worked closely with designer Malcolm Sayre in the production of the first E-Type prototype. In 1962, the lightweight E-Type represented Jaguar's hope to return to racing. In 1965, Bob Blake worked on the XJ-13 project. Swale said Blake's partnership with Sayre was magical. He said, Bob was able to translate his ideas and his design into metal. So that's where he had a really big impact. In his book, Cat Out of the Bag, author Peter Wilson wrote that Bob Blake was a totally unique talent. He was a hands-on man who also had a superb eye for style. Not only could he create a vision of shape and style, but he could then actually make it. He was the complete body man, and Jaguar was lucky to have his talents. As the years went by, Blake's love of cars never faded. By the 1970s, he was buying and repairing crash-damaged Ferraris, of which he could then be seen later driving around town. The kid born in North Dakota retired to Northampton, England, with his wife in 1978. He died in 2003. But it seems Bob Blake's humble beginnings on the Great Plains, raised by a couple of Midwestern parents, might have just stuck with him in the man that he would become. And that is back then. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you catch me next time. Get reliable and accurate local news with Inform.com. Inform.com is your trusted local news source with journalists dedicated to keeping you informed about what's happening in your community. Visit Inform.com now.